Good morning. This hearing is now called to order. So I want to say, now that we're on the record, I want to say good morning again. And I want to thank all of you for coming to this hearing. My name is Council Member Debbie Rose, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Youth Services. And today we are conducting an oversight hearing on youth employment opportunities and programming. In addition to oversight, we will be hearing intro 1474, which is sponsored by C Council Member Richie Torres, which would establish a universal youth employment program. I would like to thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, for his commitment to the youth of New York City. I would also like to thank the young people themselves, our youth advocates, program providers, and all those who have come to testify today. And finally, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us this morning. My fearless and faithful council member, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> um, youth employment is an extremely, and I, we better be joined by some other members yeah. soon. Youth employment is an extremely important issue, not just in New York City, but within our nation. Study after study demonstrates that exposure to the workforce at a younger age can reap lifelong benefits, such as a higher paying job as an adult, increased self-esteem, higher school attendance rates, increased academic engagement, and the promotion of key developmental assets. Youth employment has also been shown to have a profound societal impact, such as the reduction of crime and overall betterment of communities. But I'd also like to share with you how youth employment has made a profound impact on me personally. As a young girl growing up in Staten Island, and my staff had put um, the, what years they were, <laughs> I'm not going to say them. Um, just as a young girl. <laughs> I didn't always have a plan for my future or know exactly how to get there. At the age of 14, I applied for, and I was lucky enough to be accepted into the Summer Youth Employment Program, or SYEP, one of, uh, one of the very programs that we will be hearing a lot about today. My job through SYEP forced me to reach beyond my immediate neighborhood and expand my knowledge of the Staten Island community where I was paid to help conduct surveys about issues that my, fo my fellow Staten Islanders cared about. This experience helped to forge my life's work as a community organizer, activist, and fighter for things that I believe in. It led me to um, serving on the community board for 28 years because of um, the, what, the things I found out when we conducted that survey. This experience um, was life-changing. I believe indeed that it reinforced my desire to work in a role where I could be of service to my community. And I sit before you now as the first African-American elected to political office in Staten Island, in part because of SYEP, the, the foundational information and impact that it had on me, and I'm really thankful <clears throat> for that opportunity. But I am but one example of why it is so incredibly important for all youth seeking a job in New York City to have a job, especially those who lack connections to the old boy network or who come from circumstances that make it more difficult for them to access the labor market. That is the goal of Intro 1474 by Council Member Richard Torres and I support that goal as one of the co-sponsors of this bill. I champion a discussion about Intro 1474 and how we as a city can accomplish these objectives because youth employment should not just be a program, it should be a right. As you know, the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, is the city's lead agency in facilitating workforce development programs and employment opportunities for youth age 14 to 24. Through Workforce Connect, DYCD coordinates six main programs that provide youth with work experience and applicable skills. These programs include SYEP, of which I am a proud alumna, 
Um, they also include New York City Ladders for Leaders, Train and Earn, Learn and Earn, Intern and Earn, and Work, Learn and Grow. As each program represents a different population of need, DYCD's expansive list of programming offers youth in New York City with a wide array of employment opportunities. But is this enough? How many youth are we turning away from these programs? And what more can DYCD do to meet the employment needs of our youth? The Council has ardently fought for SYEP slots in the past budgets, and we know that the system is not always perfect. However, we work together to ensure that youth have the opportunities that they deserve, so the city as a whole can move forward um, towards a more positive future. At today's hearing, I would like to get answers to these questions and gain a deeper understanding of each of these employment programs, the components that make them effective, and how these programs can be improved. In addition, I would like to hear from the providers and our youth themselves about their experiences with these, these programs. And finally, I'd like to have a constructive conversation about intro 1474. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my staff, Issa Rogers, Christian Ravello, Christine Johnson, and my committee staff, Paul Senegal, Kevin Katowski, Michelle Peregrin, and Elizabeth Arts on the work that they have done to prepare us for this hearing. And I would um, now like to have the council swear in our officials. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony this morning, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Yes. Can you please state your names for the record? Andre White, Deputy Commissioner. Daphne Montanez, Assistant Commissioner. You can um, begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairwoman Rose and members of the Committee on Youth Services. I am Andre White, Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Connect, and I'm joined by Assistant Commissioner Daphne Montanez. On behalf of Commissioner Trung, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about DYCD's youth employment programs and to discuss Intro 1474. Thanks to the strong partnership with the Mayor, the Council, our, pro our provider community and stakeholders, the 2019 Summer Youth Employment Program was our best ever due to the new service models implemented this year. The creation of these models took extensive effort beginning in 2006 when the mayor and former speaker formed the Summer Youth Employment Task Force. As you know, the task force was comprised of a broad array of stakeholders including advocates, providers, foundation and nonprofit leaders, and focusing out to, re to bring relevant, innovative workforce experiences to youth through SYP. The recommendations included strengthening connections between SYP providers and public high schools to improve in-school career development for young people, serving younger youth through career exploration and project-based learning experiences, and enhancing support services, including pre-program orientation and counseling to help meet the unique needs of vulnerable population. Based on these recommendations, recommendations, last October, DYCD issued three RFPs that included eight program options. These program options were designed to meet the needs of the next generation of New York City talent by transforming the way young people experience and connect their interests and career options, expanding their options for career exploration and on-ramps into the program. By providing both structured project and work-based learning opportunities, New York City youth are better prepared for careers of the future. By including school-based opportunities, SYP helps young people understand the importance of their education to future careers. By intentionally reaching out to the most vulnerable of our city's youth, SYP provides work experience with wraparound support that they need to get the most out of their SUM experience. As always, employers can tap into this expanding pipeline of talent and hire job ready summer employees to increase workforce diversity and fill critical gaps in their, in their organizations. 
To implement these programs, this past summer, DYCD offered 195 awards to 67 unique providers, including 23 new providers, doubling the number of awards from the previous SYP RFP. To get the programs up and running, DYCD staff from across the agency provided trainings in a variety of areas such as worksite development, project-based project -based learning, and program implementation. DYCD also provided extensive technical assistance as needed to providers. The results speak for themselves. Despite the application period being later than usual, we received 151,000 applications. Due to baseline and early additional funding added through negotiations between the council and the mayor's office, SYP budget was a record $166.5 million. This allowed us to enroll nearly 75,000 young people, despite the increase in the minimum wage to $15 an hour and higher costs associated with our new program model. We engaged 15,576 um, youth ages 14 through 15 in over 800 structured project and work-based learning opportunities. 57,820 older youth were employed at 13,157 work sites. Of these, 43% were in private businesses. This summer, we saw a record payroll of $112.3 million. One of the highlights of our program this summer was our first DYCD Day of Action, held on August 13th. This event was designed to celebrate and showcase SYP's new approach to engaging 14 and 15-year-olds with a focus on career exploration and project-based learning. Nearly 1,000 young people ages 14 and 15 explored a range of issues in their communities, from census education to voter registration to environmental justice. At the Day of Action, they performed skits and songs, they shared videos highlighting their accomplishments. The workshops were all well attended and gave young people the opportunity to learn about each other's accomplishments while airing special presentation. Right. <laughs> <My bad. laughs> um, on discrimination laws from the City Commission on Human Rights and in international issues from UNICEF. So that you could see what this day of action meant to the participants, we have a short video for you to view now. Democracy Corps was created under the leadership of our Deputy Mayor, Phil Thompson, in order to really encourage young people to become very active within their own community so they become agents of change. I think for us within the SYP portfolio at USCD, this was a great opportunity working with our providers and local stakeholders to create an environment where young people could actually learn how to become change agents within their own communities. We worked on the census because uh, it's a big issue right now it's coming up, census 2020. And so I feel like it's an issue that needs to be addressed now or later than ever. So I feel like if people know about the census in our community, more people are likely to fill it out and then we're able to uh, get more funding out into our communities. means to lead, to empower, to encourage, and to make changes within your own communities. A day where I could see these officials and politics and tell them my ideas of how I, myself, and the other kids in my community can improve the community itself. Days of action are like the perfect way to really get um, large and small communities involved in what's going around, uh, or excuse me, what's going on around you which is a very important thing that we kind of neglect most of the time. Having a certain cause that you truly believe in, and such as uh, voting rights, and understanding how much your voice really um, matters on public policy, 
and then raising that awareness to, uh, to other people. the youth should be empowered by taking civic action because they want to take hold of their own future and be in control of what's going to happen to their lives. I think it's important for the young people and providers to understand that certain decisions that are made within their own local communities involve elected officials, involve local community members who are part of their community board, and unfortunately a lot of our young people are not familiar with these processes. So we want to make sure that young people walk away from this experience understanding how local politics is actually run and operated and who those players are. More young people can get involved on taking on civic action by spreading awareness through social media, promoting it to their peers and friends as well as providing their family with outsources on how to be more productive. Yeah. Wasn't that a great video? Oh, this is a great hearing. We have background music. <laughs> play it throughout. Thank you. This summer has demonstrated just how vital SYP is helping young people gain work experience, explore careers, build skills, and prepare for their future. With this administration and the city's council's commitment to SYP, together we have made incredible progress. DRI CD brings our expertise in youth workforce development program into a number of other initiatives as well, which I will briefly highlight work, learn, and grow. As you know, the Work, Learn, and Grow program allows young people who are enrolled in SYP and are currently in school to build off their summer experience with additional career, ready, career readiness training and paid employment opportunities during the school year. And we appreciate the Council's continued partnership on this program. This year, we anticipate a total of 4,330 slots with 300 slots allocated to our MOTJ partners as a part of the Cure Violence Initiative and the remaining slots allocated to SYP providers. All SYP providers who serve older youth participants were given the opportunity to opt into Work, Learn, and Grow this year. 49 out of the 61 eligible pro providers opted into Work, Learn, and Grow this year compared to 33 last year. Learn and earn. DYCD also runs the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act funded Learn and Earn program, formerly known as the In-School Youth Program. Learn and Earn is designed to help high school juniors and seniors graduate from high school and prepare them for employment and post-secondary education. Participants receive a combination of academic support, career exploration activities, and assistance with post-secondary education planning and paid summer work experiences. The program also supports participants with guidance and counseling, stipends, leadership development activities, and follow-up services. Participants receive up to two years um, and one year of two years of services, I'm sorry, and a year of follow-up, depending on their educational status. WIOA youth programs must meet federal and state performance standard for placement and degree slash certificate attainment. In FY20, over 1,000 youth will be served with a budget of $4.9 million. Advance and earn. For Opportunity Youth, DYCD program works to provide a comprehensive service we know that they need. As we speak, DYCD is running orientation for a brand new advance and earn program for the six organizations that were awarded contracts. In May 2019, DYCD released the advance and earn RFP, which represented a major redesign of the New York City funded Young Adult Literacy Program, as well as the intern and earn program. Through an innovative career pathways approach, this new model aims to accommodate opportunity youth at different stages of skill development and provide them with short-term outcomes as well as the skills and tools necessary to achieve long-term career success. Advance and Earn is budgeted at $30 million annually with services starting in February for non-injured participants. Train and Earn, formerly known as OSY, DYCD Train and Earn Program, formerly known as OSY Youth Program, is a federally funded short-term career pathway program for low-income youth ages 16 through 24 who are not working and not in school. Train and Earn provides job training and employment services along with the comprehensive support services needed by participants to obtain employment or enter post-secondary education or training. It's funded at $14.9 million in FY20 to serve nearly 1,300 participants. 
Intro 1474. We're proud of the work we have done with the council, the provider community, and other stakeholders to expand our ability to offer young people high quality work experiences and career preparation activities, both in school and throughout the school year. We're dedicated in our commitment towards providing New York City youth with meaningful work experience, and we appreciate the intent of Intro 1474 in meeting that goal. As our experience in developing the most recent SYP and advanced and earned RFPs demonstrate this work takes time to make sure we get it right. We'd like to have further conversations with the council about the intent of the bill, balanced with an understanding of the capacity of our workforce provider community, as well as employers to further expand services. Thank you again for allowing us to testify, and we welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you for your, um, your testimony. And I want to thank you for um, the lively video. Um, if anybody was feeling a little sleepy, I'm sure it woke them <laughs> up. Um, I'm glad that you missed your cue. It kind of really perked us up in anticipation. Um, so um, again, I, I thank you for being here. And um, uh, we've talked about you know, youth employment and workforce development. Um, how has DYCD studied how youth employment impacts New York City as a whole? I, I think at, at DYCD we are very committed to ensuring that our programs are really grounded in evidence-based practices. And we, what we have done over the years, we have, we have worked very closely with um, New York City Opportunity um, to look at data in terms of labor market information, type of best practices and promising practices that could be implemented to get better outcomes for our participants. Um, at DYCD, we have a very established research and evaluation team, um, which was implemented maybe a year ago. We've been working very closely with them to make sure that what their decisions are made um, are based in evidence. Um, I think what is important to us at DYCD is that we're setting up young people to be successful. And whatever that takes, whether it's um, piloting programs, talking to our providers to make sure that we understand what's going on on the ground, talking to researchers, we're actually looking at data, and also talking to providers. Okay. So um, is there any way that you sort of track or follow um, young people who have participated in your youth development and uh, employment programs? Absolutely. Um, within the WIOA portfolio, which are the two programs I just described, Learn and Earn and Train and Earn, young people are offered one year of services and a year of follow-up. Um, similarly to our Intern and Earn program, once they exit the program, there's nine months of follow-up to make sure that they're getting the support services that they need to connect them to a job or to connect them to some sort of educational program programming. So there's indeed follow-up services to make sure that young people keep on task and keep on the right path to being successful. Thank you. Um, are these uh, youth employment programs accessible to undocumented youth? Currently, unfortunately, they're not. We, we do understand that undocumented youth should have an opportunity to work, but as you, as you can imagine, the legal complexity that comes with that has been quite challenging for this administration. For many years, we've been researching this particular topic, um, and we're still trying to determine what is the best way to approach this. Um, as you know, within youth employment, it requires employment authorization by the federal government. These are state laws that we have to abide by. Um, and unfortunately, right now, there's no way around that. There's also some complications around the banking laws, right? The, after 9-11, as you know, the, uh, the Patriot Act was released, which connected to the KYC law, which is Know Your Customer um, law, which banks are required to really identify folks are actually always in legal status to be able to use certain banking products. So I, I just threw a lot at you, but as you can imagine, it's quite a complicated issue, and we're still trying to figure out how to approach it. Would NY, um, IDNYC be, um, wouldn't that be helpful in terms of providing some of the information that would be required? Yes, I, I think, you know, 
as many experts we could get around the table to really brainstorm and troubleshoot. You know, we have had conversations with the law department. Um, we have conversations with folks at Moya. So again, we've, we've done our due diligence and we are coming up against some roadblocks, as you can imagine, because of the laws. And we're still willing and committed to figure out alternative ways, if possible at all, to make sure that this population is served as well. So um, in the absence of being able to provide undocumented youth with jobs, um, do you provide referrals or other options um, to you know, other maybe agencies or uh, other sources of employment? Right, so particularly within the SYP program, as you know, a large percent, percentage of the slots are lottery based. On our website, every spring, we launch what's called an SYP alternative opportunity listing for those young people who are not selected from the lottery. And essentially what it is, is a list of 30 or so opportunities, job opportunities, internship and volunteer opportunities. And for those young people who are not documented, they're able to take advantage of the volunteer opportunities. The volunteer, okay. But nothing paid? Not right now, okay. correct. So uh, you did mention that you're taking steps to try to figure out how to address undocumented youth in terms of programming for them, right. job we're, opportunities. We're, we're, we're correct, we're looking at the law and see exactly what can be done, if at all anything. Okay. Um, so you were, um, you received a total of 150,000 30 applications for SYEP. Um, Correct. And do you, do you have a, a copy of the chart, of this chart? Do they have a copy of this chart? Well, they provided in terms, us. Oh, okay. So you provided us with the numbers of applications that you receive for each of your community-based um, programs, Ladders for Leaders, school-based um, vulnerable youth, New York City map, um, I mean NYCHA map, uh, SYEP NYCHA, sector focus, DOE, cure violence, and SYEP CUNY. Um, could you break those down for us in terms of how many um, were uh, served, 14 to 15 population and 16 to 24? Sure. Okay. So um, you want to start with community-based? Yes. Um, are you looking for the application number as well or only the enrollment number? Just the enrollment. 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 Community-based younger youth, ages 14 through 15, 15,576. Older youth, 58,877. Ladders for leaders, it's only older youth, 1,173. Um, career Ready, which is the school-based option. Younger youth, 1,903. Older youth, 4,406. Vulnerable youth, younger youth, 907. Older youth, 3,152. NYCHA map, younger youth, 983. Older youth, 1,978. Uh, sector focus, which is primarily older youth, 748. Uh, cure of violence, younger youth, 73, older youth, 225, and I think I covered it all, right? DOE and SYEP. And um, S, um, you, did you do DOE? Yes, that's okay. school-based career ready. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, S, oh, could you just give us those numbers then for school-based um, DOE? Sh sure. Younger youth, 1,903, and for older youth, 4,406. Okay, and SYP CUNY. And for SYP for CUNY, it's all older youth, 1,021. Okay. okay. For each of the above, um, uh, could you provide the number of SYP job sites? Or, no, not for each of the above. Just could you provide the number of SYP job sites disaggregated by name and the number of youth working at each site? We could, we could definitely provide that. Um, that's going to take some deep analysis, ah. and that's going to take us some time. But we could, we could absolutely get that to you. Okay. Um, 
How many um, uh, SYEP job sites do you have? 13,000. 13,157 total sites for this summer. And um, what types of, or how many different work sector areas are you involved with in SYEP? Yeah, so we have a number of sectors, right? Um, I think what is important to understand is we encourage our providers to develop job opportunities um, in conjunction with the career pathway sectors. Um, so keeping that in mind, we also have services, I'm sorry, jobs in the social service realm, healthcare, government agencies, um, daycare, day camp, which is a big part of the older youth placements, retail, um, and arts and recreation. Um, which, uh, which of these sectors has, has the most participants and which has the least? So right now, uh, daycare, day camp, we have as much as 16,000 young people placed in those sites. Mm -hmm. And the lease is manufacturing. We only have 68 young people placed um, in that particular sector. Um, in light of all the climate change uh, talk and things, are we encouraging um, youth, or what areas are we encouraging youth like uh, green jobs, um, government, culinary, farming, urban farming? Yeah, when the young folks apply to SYP and the application, we's very, we are very specific about understanding what their career interests are, right? You know, I, I think it's important to match young people to careers that they want to explore. Um, so it ranges from sector to sector, industry to industry. Um, in terms of green jobs, this summer, we had over 150 work sites within that sector and over 2,436 young people that were placed in green jobs. Um, we had young people working at New York Botanical Gardens. Um, some of them were urban agricultural assistants, you know. So as you, can, as you can imagine, when we develop jobs, we want to make sure that this is what the young people have an interest in. So we're very, very intentional about that. We just don't want to attach a young person. We want to move away from that rapid attachment mentality where you get a summer job, we give you a job because you want a job, but, but understanding what is it that you want to do long term and how can we provide those experiences to you during the summer. Are we providing them with the opportunities for tech jobs? We do. I, I will say that's a, a field that's a little bit difficult to penetrate. Um, what we do recognize with a lot of the tech companies, there's a lot of interns that are willing to take a volunteer and not paid experiences with them. Um, and a lot of them are smaller startups, right? And unfortunately, they just don't have the capacity and the staff to supervise these young people. Um, so that's a field that's been really quite difficult for us to develop, but what we have done on the project-based learning side for younger youth is to make sure that there's a lot of technology that's infused into the projects that young people are working on. I would think maybe your Ladders for Leaders program might be um, a, a good source for um, yeah, we, we, uh, yeah, we absolutely have a few um, sites in, in, in the Ladders for Leaders bucket but I wouldn't say it's a whole lot of tech companies, a lot more financial companies and, and a few marketing folks that are really within the ladder's portfolio. Starting this year, SYEP offered younger youth age 14 to 15 a stipend of $700 for project-based experience, guided by 90 hours of instruction. Receipt of full stipend is contingent upon a certain criteria. What is that criteria, um, the criteria that determines younger youth receiving the full stipend? Um, so before we implemented the younger youth uh, model this summer, we did, we did a series of pilots. Uh, and what we did, because again, data helps us inform the decisions that we're making. Um, so in previous years, we recognize 80% attendance rate is what we've seen across all the pilots that we have done. So we apply that to the current model. So essentially, young people, out of the 15 hours that they're required to work, they need to show up for a minimum of 12 hours to be paid their stipend. 
how many of the younger youth participants actually received 100% of that stipend? So participation is important to us. Um, and I think for us, we wanted to ensure that young people showed up, right? They were very engaged in their projects and they were learning and, I, and they, they were having meaningful experiences. Um, so the stipend was that carrot, right? To make sure that they showed up week after week. And I'm really excited to, to, to tell you that the average participation rate from week to week was 95%. 95% yes. actually received the full stipend based on their attendance? On average, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I could break that down for oh, you. For can, week can one, you give us a number? 90, I'm sorry? Can you give us a number? What I could give you percentages. Represent? I could no. give you percentages. You, um, you can't give me actual body count? I could. I could. Okay. <laughs> um, so week one, we paid almost... 13,000 young people, um, and that was consistent all the way through week, I would say week five, and then week six, we saw a drop off to maybe around 11,000. 11,000. Out of a total number that was enrolled? Yes. Uh, what was the total number? 15. Enrolled? 15? Yeah, 15, seven, four, six. Okay. Um, what was the total value of the stipends that were paid out? Are you asking me the total amount? The total of amount we, of money yeah. that was paid I'll, out? I, I, I want to say it's over $8 million um, that we actually paid out in stipends. And I'm correct. Yes, it's $8.2 million that were actually paid out in stipends um, and $103 million in wages. So you know that um, one of the issues that um, the community groups and young people um, objected to this particular initiative was because it, it represented a reduction in the amount of money that young people um, who economically would need the money would get. Um, are you looking at uh, evaluating that and maybe increasing the amount of the stipend that young people will, who participate in this program will receive? I, I think we, we absolutely understand the importance of SYP being an experience that provides supplemental income for the young people um, and their families, and we absolutely value that. But I think what's more important to us is making sure that we're setting up young people for the future of work, making sure we're equipping them with the skills and competencies that are necessary. Um, and that's something that you necessarily can't put a dollar value on. You wanna make sure that they're prepared as much as they can be for the, the labor market, and as you know, the nature and the future of work is changing. And now we have a great opportunity to make sure that we really zone in and focus in on those critical thinking and ability skills that employers are looking for. Um, and this re reimagined SYP allows us and give us that opportunity. And I just don't think you could put a dollar value on that. But you did recognize the value of that dollar um, amount uh, because you used it as a carrot to get them there absolutely. to, to Ab participate. Absolutely. And so um, I'm, I'm just concerned because I was not an advocate for you know that particular um, model. I, I, I like the model, but you know the fact that young people and their families need um, the help, absolutely, this, this yeah. financial help, and so it was my hope that you would evaluate the value, and um, and and we could have a conversation about increasing the the amount of the stipend. Okay. What does that mean? Yes. Or okay. What? Yeah, we're we're more than happy to have conversations <laughs> about the younger youth model. Mm -hmm. So at budget time, we'll have that conversation? Or prior to? I, 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 again, I, I think before, and I'm not opposed to 
young people making more money. That's, that's not the case that I'm trying to make. I think for us, it's really about the experience and what young people are walking away from. I, I think before we start talking about making significant changes to this model, we need to look at what lessons were learned this summer. And we're in the process of conducting focus groups with our evaluation teams. We're meeting with young people. We're meeting with providers. And I think to make informed decisions, we need to look at the data, and we want to see what young people are saying, what providers are saying. Um, and then once we have all the information in front of us, we could then evaluate different aspects of the program. So you are collecting that type of information then? I'm, I'm sorry, what type are you referring to? This? The, all just, of the evaluative information absolutely. you just stated, right. you, are, or you are collecting that information now so that Right, we're collecting a conversation uh, right. There's about There's a it. number of indicators. An that informed we're... conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, are you going to um, present, uh, develop an, an actual evaluation form that you could share with us? We could absolutely share the results of the evaluation once no, it's no, completed. Can we see the form? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, there are different instruments that we're utilizing, so we're more than happy to share that with you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, in DYCD school-based career ready SYEP, what changes did you implement? Are you referring in to? In your career ready SYEP. So as you know, we piloted um, career ready two, two years ago, um, and, I, and I think for me, what was really special was the, the relationships that I saw providers and principals really developed. Um, they were both very committed to making sure that they were meeting young people where they are um, and ensuring that whatever services that providers and principals were bringing to the school is, what, is the services young people could benefit from. Um, this summer, we saw over 6,000 young people engage in, in this option, uh, both across younger youth, older youth, um, I think it's only going to get stronger as we develop employer partnerships and relationships and also develop more hands-on and interesting projects for the young people. Um, what was the funding level for the new RFP, which was released September 26? So there, there are two RFPs that were actually released, right? So there was a career ready RFP that was released and the special initiatives RFP that was released. Um, for FY20 20 and 21, right, so SYP crosses two fiscal year, we're looking at an average of $4 million. Um, and for the special initiatives, we're actually looking at 321,000. How many awards do you anticipate um, uh, giving out? Um, typically, how the RFP process works, um, we once the applicant is deemed viable and we have funding, we typically award as much um, award as we have. As we typically award um, contracts based on the amount of funding we have. I'm sorry? Based on the amount of funding, uh -huh. that's the number of awards we would typically issue. For example, with school base, right now, if you look at the RFP, there's 53 schools, right, that, that um, could potentially apply with a provider, and then we're going to go down that list based on the number of applicants and make those awards if they're viable. Um, and what were the changes to the special initiatives program? There are no changes. It's just an expansion of last year's RFP. Oh, okay. And um, which population are you targeting for that special N initiative? Um, NYCHA, NYCHA MAP, and general NYCHA, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I'd like to uh, mention that we've been joined by Council Member Chin. Hi, Council Member. Work, learn, grow. <laughs> <laughs>
from fiscal year 2019's 33 participating providers to fiscal year 2020's 49 participating providers, how many slots did each provider receive? So as I mentioned in um, my testimony, there was a methodology that was used to determine how many slots providers receive, right? So there are 61 eligible older youth providers of which 49 opt in to work, learn, and grow. Um, we are budgeted for 4,330 slots, and we essentially looked at the number of people that wanted to participate and divided that by the 4330, and the, an average was around 82 slots. About 82 yeah. slots and, yes. per provider? Right, but, but again, it's a, that, that's the average, um, and then once we spoke to providers and determined capacity, some providers was very open and honest about their capacity, so they took fewer slots, and there were some providers who could take on more who asked for more. How were the, um, the providers selected? Um, we gave every provider an opportunity to opt in, so there was no short application process. Unfortunately, in the midst of SYP, um, providers were running programs and work learning and grow had to be up and running in September. And the short application process typically takes anywhere from three to four months. So unfortunately, there was no time this year. So we, to be fair and transparent, we gave each provider the opportunity to participate, if each SYP provider the opportunity to participate if they wanted to. So um, how many providers are there in each borough? for Work, Learn, and Grow. So the Bronx, we have 10 providers. Brooklyn, 18. Manhattan, 10. Queens, 10. And Staten Island, one. And you know the most obvious question is going to be, why is there only one in Staten Island? Again, when we, when we were going through the process of determining which providers wanted to opt in, we gave the providers the ability to determine where they want to serve young people. Um, within the SYP portfolio, there's also the Children's Aid Society that serve young people on Staten Island. They opted not to serve young people on Staten Island. They opted to serve young people in, in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So um, if we're looking at, at this in terms of trying to be somewhat proportional, um, and if every program provider got an average of 81 enrollees, right? Um, could it be safe to say that Staten Island should, re despite the fact that they have one provider, that they should have more than 81 participants in this program? They actually have more than 81. They actually have over 102 um, slots. They're a part of also a pilot that we are testing, a concept that we're testing for Work, Learn, and Grow. So they're actually, Staten Island currently has the IS um, allotment for Work, Learn, and Grow, along with four other providers. Are they the only um, provider that um, will have more than 81? Participants? There are five other providers that's a part of the pilot, so they were given an additional 50 slots, um, and those folks will have 102 slots each. Okay. Okay. Um, and if the budget grew above its current fiscal 2020 level of 19 million for programming, could these same 49 providers uh, take on more participants? It's been a practice of ours to really have dialogue with our providers to determine capacity and what's doable. Um, so I think for us, we'd have to go back to our providers and have that conversation to determine if the capacity is there. Okay, and I just have um, one more question because I know my colleagues would like to ask something and I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, you have a question, Michael? Yeah, okay. Um, how many participants are in Work, Learn, learn Grow currently?
Uh, enrollment stands at 4,034 slots. Uh -huh. um, we're still in the process of running lotteries. Um, the first day of the program was last Wednesday, last Wednesday um, and we're not fully enrolled yet. As you know, it takes a few weeks even to get to full enrollment. So then you wouldn't know what the dis distribution numbers were um, not, citywide? Okay. Not yet. Okay. Um, I'm going to yield so that my colleague could ask some questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your leadership on this. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, when you were talking about the program for the younger youth, and you were saying that from like week one to week five, you see a steady number of 13,000, and then all of a sudden by week six, it went down to 11,000. That's like 2,000 youth that did not show up um, at the program. So are you looking into why all of a sudden there's a drop off towards the, the end of the program? I, I think based on historical data and historical context, this is a new model, but um, typically by week six, what we see a lot of parents are preparing for the start of school um, and they're taking summer vacations, right? So they go down south to see mommy and grandpa and granddad or the kids just want to break from working. Um, and that's typical across both the younger youth and older youth, where there's a drop off by the last week of the program. Well, I, th I think we should really s seriously take a look at that because um, from the statistic that you provided, there was 150,000 people that apply, right? The submitted application. And Correct. We only had funding for 75,000. So half of the young people did not get the opportunity. Uh, so in terms of... Actually, we, yes, we did have 150,000 applications, but in order to fill 74,000 jobs, we made offers, job offers, to over 110,000 participants. So I think it's important to know that we actually made offers to over 110,000. Okay. So it's only a little bit maybe, maybe than 30, 40,000 young people that didn't get an opportunity to work. Okay. I mean, that's, that's good to know. That's a big difference. Otherwise, it's like, wow, you only, we only were able to have help after <laughs> the young people. So looking at all these, you know, statistics in the last few years, because you know that the council has been advocating for universal SYEP, and every year we've been fighting um, to increase the number of opportunity. So is DYCD really looking at expanding the capacity so that we can meet that goal that every youth that apply will be given an opportunity? We have definitely expanded the provider pool. Um, we, we have 23 new providers within the portfolio. Um, so I, I think for us it goes just beyond the providers, right? We have to also look at the labor market in New York City and to determine whether or not we could develop over potentially 20,000 jobs for young people. Currently, as it stands, I think providers do a really good job of developing jobs within the private and public sector, but it's not an easy feat. Um, so for us, we have to be mindful as we talk about scaling up, whether the providers can indeed serve the young people. Are there enough employers that are willing to take on young people during the summer? Um, and, and my concern there is an employer could raise their hand and say, absolutely, I'll take a kid, but is, I'm sorry, a young person, but, it, but is it a meaningful job where young people are actually developing the skills that we want to see them develop? But so you, but you for us, still, it's about quality versus quantity. But are you engaging the providers to really look at, you know, that that's the goal that we wanted to meet and we really have to consistently work towards that? I mean, we're here in the council, we're supportive, but we also wanted to hear from DYCD and the provider, how do we get there so that we can advocate for the funding 
you know, to increase the, the number of opportunity every single year. Yeah. I, I think providers are willing, they're, they're very passionate about this work, they're committed to this work. I think um, the culture has shifted a little bit in terms of the type of job opportunities that we have presented to young people. Um, and we're, we're sort of moving away from that rapid attachment mentality, as I mentioned before. Um, I, I think because the unemployment rate is so low, we've also seen providers struggle because obviously a lot of small amount pop businesses doesn't necessarily need the help um, as much. So again, we could definitely have conversations with our providers. We could come up with, which we have done, uh, technical assistance around employer, employer engagement strategies and how to develop jobs that are meaningful. Um, but again, we have to see exactly what that looks like uh, and what the New York City job market could actually take. Are you looking at, I mean, we were talking about the different sectors. Are you looking at the, the food sector? I mean, we have, we just opened up an urban farm in my district, and I know that there are a lot of them across the city. Are those, you know, is that sector, you know, Absolutely. are you engaging them to hire youth to work during the summer? Every possible type of job opportunity that you could think of is actually a part of our portfolio. Our providers are very creative and innovative in terms of the job opportunities that they try to provide. So we do have urban farms um, in our portfolio. And last year, um, Chiro's, we went out to one in Staten Island. So again, we try to diversify as much as we can. It's really about the capacity of the number of jobs that folks are willing to, to work with providers on for young people. Yeah, definitely. I think that in the public sector, urban farms and our public market um, that are in the city, I mean, those are really great potential because they are in the community. And if we can really work with them to offer job opportunities to our young people, I think that would be great and would definitely, you know, would be helpful um, in doing that. And in my district, I have an urban farm and I have the asset market. Awesome. So I want to make sure that <laughs> yeah. they're connected. Good. Thank you. We Thank appreciate you. that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Chin. Um, what would the expansion of a true, truly year-round work, learn, grow program look like to you? I mean, because currently it runs only from October to March. So, what would I, I, I think? It depends on how you define year-round. Um, I'm assuming you're referring to the, the school year, which is September through June. Mm -hmm. um, again, within Work, Learn, and Grow. We're piloting a concept right now. Um, we're looking at different ways to enhance the program model. It's quite complex because as you know, young people, their main priority during the school year is school, their academics. Um, and we have to make sure that there's a balance between the work experience and their academics and work is not getting in the way of that. Mm -hmm. um, so as we're testing concepts and we're working very closely with um, folks from Council Finance, Michelle and Regina, you know, we have our monthly meetings and we're really committed to try and figure this out. Um, can you envision this program being 12 months if the funding was there? Um, I'm a little bit apprehensive because I know particularly for the older youth um, around March, April when it's Regents time, young people really focus on their academics, right? And we don't want that tension where young people have signed up for a program but can't commit. Um, so again, we could definitely talk to young people. We have to engage principals. I think that's important to understand that tension um, and determine what would be the best fit. So are you um, thinking about working that into the pilot program? N not for uh, a year, not from a September through June perspective, but in terms of how we engage young people and the length of time and what that would look like, yes. Okay, I'd like to be a part of that, that conversation. That young lady next to you is. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have repeat um, participants year after year, or does the lottery sort of curtail um, young people repeating? We do have um, young people that are blessed and lucky, um, and they're selected from the lottery year after year. I, unfortunately, I don't have that number with me, but I'm, I'm more than happy to share it if you guys would like to see that. Yeah, um, I encountered some young people who were very disappointed they had participated in Work, Learn, Grow um, the previous year, and they were not 
selected. Um, but there were others that were. So um, I just wanted to know, is this what, is this a true lottery lottery or it's an are absolute people lottery. sort of asked to come back because no. they were wonderful workers or no, it's an absolute lottery. It it's, it's a database mm -hmm. that we have developed um, over the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. I remember running lotteries myself when I was um, the SYP director. And it's a true and fair system that we've been using for, for many, many years. It's a true lottery. So you feel that um, that a young person could get the, the total value of the Work Learn program um, within this nine month you know, range? I'm sorry. Like, can like, you? So um, there's not like, you don't feel like there's a need for it to be a continuum but because they, it, it's such a robust program that if they participate in one nine month, you know, session, then they have gotten what they've, you know, what they could get from the program. Well, I, I think it, it, it depends, right, um, on what that particular outcome is that we're looking for, for work, learn, and grow. And I think that's what we're trying to determine. So, I'm asking you, do you think that there's a need to build upon it so that um, we actually need to increase the numbers incrementally um, so that young people are getting a continued benefit from the program? Or do you feel that, you know, one, you know, round of work, learn, grow gives them all that, you know, your, your goals are, whatever your objectives yeah. are for I, the I, program. I, right. I think the research shows that continuous engagement um, year after year really leads to really positive outcomes in the labor market for young people, and that's something that we would love to see. Okay. Advance and earn. Can you, um, can you tell us about um, the, the many, some of the proposals you've received? Uh, sure, so um, recently we announced our awards. We made six awards uh, to six providers. Um, we have providers in every borough, and in fact we have two in the Bronx. So beginning in the Bronx, we have The Door, uh, in Queens, Samuel Field Y, uh, Manhattan, Stanley Isaacs Neighborhood Center, Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow in Brooklyn, and uh, Montefiore Community Center in Moshaloo in the Bronx, and NYSARC in Staten Island. Um, and how many slots will each provider have? 150 each. Okay. Um, and will you be, um, will you do an evaluation of the Advance and Earn program? Absolutely. So um, in coordination with the Office of uh, Economic Opportunity, which uh, funds the Advance and Earn program, we're very much focused on evaluating this model. This is a new model. Um, it, it's not replicated anywhere nationally, so we're very excited to uh, launch and uh, get as much learning as we can, uh, particularly during the first year uh, of the program. Um, uh, do you know when you will conduct this evaluation? So we don't have a timeline as of yet. However, uh, our contract uh, starts November 1st. Program services start in February for our first cohort. So evaluations will certainly begin uh, with the, within the first cohort. Okay. Um, we would uh, we would appreciate um, being. Uh, getting a copy of the evaluation. Um, do you believe that the redesign was necessary? You know, um, I guess, I mean, were the outcomes from the Young Adult Literacy Program and the earn, an intern and earn were just not strong enough to justify the continuation as standalone programs? What sort I, I, of motivated I, this redesign? 
I think, yes, absolutely. So there, as you know, there were two evaluations conducted in both YLP and Intern and Earn. And while there were some key findings, some positive findings, what we did recognize, there was also some um, not so not positive findings around long-term employment um, in terms of the earning potential that we saw um, for each participant. Also, what was missing from the current model is the wraparound and support services that young people need to really thrive and do well within our programs. Um, very similar to a, a learning, I'm sorry, training and program, young people are not in school and not working. They have significant challenges and barriers, right? Um, and we recognize for them to be successful, they have to be stabilized. Within th with this model, we're providing food, um, we're providing metro cards. We're making sure that there is a, a licensed social worker on site to provide case management and support to those young people. There's also what we're calling a navigator to ensure if there are other services outside of the nonprofit realm that they might need assistance with, that, that those services are catered towards the young people. While the research has shown as much intervention and that you could provide, the outcomes are gonna be better for young people. And I think while Intern and Earn provided short-term earnings and gains for some young people, we want to actually set up young people for a career, and Advance and Earn does that. It's a continuum that really walks young people from a very low reading grade level all the way through an advanced training option with the intention of making sure that they're placed within a career that pays a living wage. I want to commend you for, you know, um, recognizing that there is a need for supportive services and that um, there's more value to a comprehensive program. Um, but I, I was wondering, uh, when you combine the Young Adult Literacy Program and the Intern and Earn, how many people were you serving combined? So we're serving over 2,000 young people combined with both programs. Well, both programs. Yeah. And now you're serving how many? Um, 900 young people. How many? 900. 900, OK. Yeah. And that's because the support services cost more. Right. So essentially, I, I think for us, um, if, this is a very ambitious model, let me say that. This has never been tested or rolled out across the country. So New York City is really setting the stage for a model that could be replicated across the country. And we want to see ourselves as leaders in this space. Um, I think quality, again, versus quantity is important. We want to make sure that providers have the necessary resources to set up young people to be successful. Once we have gone through maybe a year or two of this program, um, I, I think folks um, will be willing to have the conversation about scaling to serving more young people. But it's such, there's so many touch points, you have to be very careful in terms of how you scale. What is the eligibility criteria um, to get into this program? So we have uh, within the program three distinct options. Uh, the first is the pre-HSC option, and that will serve uh, young people who are reading at the fourth through eighth grade level, mm -hmm. uh, reading level. Um, and those would be uh, young people who are ages 16 to 24 years of age. Then we have the HSC uh, option, and th that will serve young people 16 to 24 years of age that are reading at a ninth grade. Uh, reading level at a minimum. And then for advanced training uh, option, this will serve young people who have an, uh, either a high school diploma or HSC uh, equivalent and uh, serving young people 18 to 24 years of age. Is there an income uh, criteria? No. no. Okay, great. Um, just a slight shift, but uh, what other program models administered by other city agencies do you think could be tied to the work that DYCD is doing? So we, we work very closely with our partners at the Department of Education. Um, work, we work very closely with our partners at CUNY. We're all a part of the recently launched Career Ready Initiative, which is how we better align workforce and educational programs across the city. Um, and to, to give you a perfect example, we developed our database system maybe 10 years ago 
which manages our payroll, application and worksite development processes. And working with DOE, they were able to replicate um, that very same system and apply that to one of their programs. So we're, we're constantly supporting each other, providing resources, and the conversations are happening, if not daily, um, I would say weekly. Um, are there some other city agencies that are not traditionally, you know, youth development or workforce development, but like SBS, do they have any youth targeted programs? Uh, we work, we refer um, young people EGC. to our program, mm -hmm. to the SBS programs if they're over 18, because SBS primarily serves young people over 18. Um, and, you know, we have conversations with the deputy commissioner who manages their workforce program occasionally as well. We worked with, um, had a great meeting with HRA two weeks ago, and they're looking to tap into our vulnerable youth option within SYP and how to figure out how to better coordinate within our other, our, our other workforce programs. So there's a lot of conversations going on, and we're trying to align as much as we can. Okay. Um, about intro 1474, um, could you just elucidate again what your concerns are regarding this bill? I think we just want to get a better understanding of exactly what the goals are and what the program model will look like, right? I know the bill talks about providing year-round or some experiences to participants if they want both or they could opt into one or or another, right? There's also language in the bill that talks about pr connecting young people to city services um, and just fleshing that out a little bit more in terms of what does that mean. And um, We know currently within our other workforce programs, we have navigators doing that work and they're technically what we call case managers. And the caseload there is anywhere from one to 20 participants. Um, so we have to just think about what that would look like on a larger scale. What would be the total cost to create a universal youth employment program? And have you ever done a cost analysis? We haven't done a, a cost analysis, um, but we know it will be a significant cost attached to it. Um, if you look at the current landscape, we're, our budget for SYP, particularly this summer, was $166 million, and we're only serving 74,000 young people. So at scale, you could imagine um, providing a job to every young person, how much that would be. Do you have um, some sense of how many youth would be impacted by uh, the creation of a universal youth employment program? So we know in New York, um, there's close to over over 320,000 young people between ages 15 through 21, right? We're still trying to figure out the number of 14 year olds right now. So that's the, that's the range, sort of the yeah. Universe. So it might be closer to 370 when we get the 14 year olds in. Do you believe that there's a need for um, universal youth employment program in New York City? I think, each young person should have an opportunity to be connected to some sort of in employment, internship, or volunteer opportunity if they would like one. Um, and I, when I think about universal, that doesn't mean that every kid might want to work. Some young people might want to be engaged in volunteer opportunities. Some young people might want to you know, shadow mommy and daddy at work. So I, I think when we think about providing young people with employment opportunities, we should just we should not just limit it to a job, but guest speakers, um, visiting offices, volunteering experiences. You want to give them the gamut to choose from because all of those you know mm -hmm. um, experiences could really have an impact. Um, I just have one more question because we have people who would like to um, testify. Um, in your Lattice for Leadership program, um, seventy percent of your participants are college students and 30% are high school students. Um, are you looking to um, increase the number of high school students that are participating in this program, especially since we've talked about sort of earlier intervention in terms of workforce development um, and career opportunities? Um, 
Yeah. Are you concerned about that number? Yeah, we once we look at the data every summer, we're always trying to figure out how to address certain issues. Um, and Daphne Montanez, who manages that program, she's already engaged the team to come up with a recruiting strategy for targeting high school students. And I could have Daphne talk a little bit about what that looks like. Sure. I think one of the great things about having a portfolio of workforce programs uh, with providers and subject matter experts already on the ground is that it gives us an opportunity to find opportunities where we can work together. And one of the things that we want to do is work closely with our career-ready school-based um, schools and providers within SYEP to help them identify young people who would qualify for Ladders for Leaders um, and to start creating a pipeline, if you will, for Ladders. So we're actually going to be piloting that this, uh, this coming year. The application for Ladders will be released later uh, this year, um, probably in early December and uh, we're looking to identify um, some schools where uh, we think there would be a, a good group of young people who meet the qualifications um, but just need some additional assistance and more awareness around the program A and B completing an application and whatever other additional assistance that they may need. So, um, so then sort of your recruitment is rather selective in terms of what schools you seek out. You, you don't, um, is your distribution for recruitment all of our schools, say all yes. of our high schools? Yes, this is okay. citywide. Any young person who meets the criteria, 16 to 22 years of age, right. previous work experience, mm -hmm. Um, meeting the grade point, grade point average requirement is invited to apply. We've worked closely with our DOE partners on uh, providing marketing materials when once the application is up and, and running to encourage their students to apply. And I think what we want to do now is just be more intentional in targeting uh, schools that we already have relationships with, that with students that we already have relationships with as a next step, a progress in in their internship experience okay and um, I would just like to see the the distribution list of not now <laughs> but um, where how you recruit I'd like to see your recruitment efforts um, okay so I'd like to thank you thank you so much and the only thing I think I've asked of you um, to provide for us is the evaluation when um, when you put it together, and to be a part of that conversation. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good day. You too. Thanks. First panel. Oh, yeah, you can. Okay. Lazar Treshin, Here to Hear. Alicia Guevara, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Frederick Watts and Marcel Brethwaite, the Police Athletic League, and Suzette Bodhi, Core Services Group. Hi, how are you? Thank you for your patience. And um, well, I, all you need to do is identify yourself, your organization, and you can begin your testimony. Uh, good morning, uh, still morning. Uh, nice job of that. 
Um, so thanks, uh, thanks so much to uh, Chairman uh, Rose, Chairperson Rose, and, and, and the council for, for, for having us and for listening to this issue. My name is Lazar Treschan. I'm the Vice President for Policy at Here to Here, which is a new Bronx-based intermediary designed to uh, connect young people to uh, rewarding careers through um, really an effort to expand work-based learning and career pathways in both our high schools and, and public universities here in New York. Um, so I provide a testimony, which I will do everyone the favor of not reading, um, and just sort of speak to some, some big points and then some smaller points. In the big picture, I think um, summer youth employment is the greatest untapped resource in New York City to bridge the equity gap um, that young people see uh, both in our, in our high schools and colleges. Um, I come, I, after spending 12 years at the Community Service Society, a lot of my work was on school segregation and integration. And the research I did really showed that the differences between young people, as we know, aren't that any, young people aren't smarter than the other, um, don't have more motivation than the other, but really when they step onto a high school, into a high school and into college, they just have different resources behind them. And classrooms and teachers can do a lot um, to support that, but there's so much that happens outside the classroom. <laughs> it's, and, and especially in this world, we know it's not what you know, but it's, it's who you know. And, um, in my interviews with young people, and if, even if you just look at college a uh, application essays, um, you're never writing about what happens in math or science class. You're writing about an internship, a work experience, community service, a trip you took. And the material that different young people from different backgrounds have to put in that college essay, and that college essay is a reflection of what they know about themselves and what they know about the world. And we are really creating an unfair world where some young people are able to have that knowledge of self, what their skills, passions, and interests are, and have that knowledge of what the outer world is, and how do I make that connection between who I am, uh, what my passions are, and what I want to be, and how I can contribute to this world. And that, to me, is the major equity gap we're facing. You know, we can, the, the number one way to solve segregation, and I believe this, is through enrollment-focused integration. But while we wait for uh, privileged white people to give up that power, we need to do something else to put people on an equal playing field. Um, and to me, it's how do we use internships and work-based learning? So in 2016, I put out a proposal for universal summer jobs, um, not only making it a universal program, you know, 80% of SYP participants are in high school. Um, that's because high school students are looking for something to connect to um, their educations. And we have the summer as this opportunity that they can build uh, off of uh, their education and really put that uh, to work in figuring out who they are and develop those other skills around time management and soft skills that are allow them to be successful, not just in careers, but in college. So much about college is handling that administrative stuff, navigation and time management skills that they don't really get the same way in high school. So I believe we need to take SYP, and we've done this with a school-based SYP, and, and, and we were happy to be the driving force uh, behind that, and with the Youth Employment Task Force and all the work of the administration, and really the council, and then Julissa uh, uh, Ferreris and, and the great uh, staff, including yourself, that, that worked on that. But really, we, should, we have an opportunity here to reimagine high school in New York City. It should go from a 10-month program to a 12-month program, where every young person has the option for a paid two-month internship to extend uh, their learning into the summer. Um, you can have teachers and guidance counselors help you create an internship that gets you excited and engaged about high school, have much better success in college. We see uh, college retention rates are really low among, around uh, uh, black and Latino young people, and that's precisely because they're not having the experiences that allow them to make that selection well. Um, the, the lower income you are, and if you're black and Latino, you're more likely to choose a community college that is close to your house and major in liberal arts, and those are the programs that have the highest uh, non-completion rates. Um, again, it's not because those young people aren't motivated and smart, they just don't have those connections to make those informed choices. So we think there's a great opportunity to really take uh, this uh, SYEP and not use it as a way to get kids off the streets and develop some skills, but really make it a rich connection to school and part of every high school experience in New York City. And it would be an incredible legacy for the city council to continue the move in that direction. We appreciate that the city has taken those first steps, but we'd like to see that happen further. In the small picture, you know, there were some bumps this year with school-based SYP. You may hear a little bit about that, but that is natural in the first year of any program. 
Um, it is incredibly exciting, the, the, the comments that we had from some of the campuses we worked with on school-based SYP to see young people who feel excited to go back to school in the fall because they had this engaging experience. They have an idea of the colleges they're going to start looking at because they had this experience. Um, and that teachers, in, um, instead of seeing work as something outside of their classroom, now have so much material to give students projects and assignments that really build on their interests um, rather than something disconnected. So in the small picture, we do need to uh, continue to, to, to support school-based SYP and its growth, give providers and schools more time to develop those relationships, um, not throw as much paperwork as them as possible, really work to streamline that, really um, give chance for employers to come in at an earlier time rather than right before the summer and really work with young people because that's part of the learning experience for everyone. We also want to use this program as a way for employers to change their views about young people in New York City. Um, and that can only happen, I think, if we make the program universal, if we make it as big as possible, connect it to the schools. This is not to push out the CBOs, just the opposite. These contracts will bring community-based organizations and their employer relationships into schools, empowering schools, empowering young people, and really transforming what education is in here in New York City. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning still. Uh, my name is Fred Watts. I'm the Executive Director of the Police Athletic League and I thank you for the opportunity to testify before you. I am with Marcel Braithwaite who's our Director of Community Engagement. He should be giving this testimony because he knows more than I do. But since I'm his boss, I, I decided to sit here myself. Um, I, I wanted to thank the Council who has been very supportive of PAL and you specifically, Council Member Rose. Um, and, and DYCD, who is our biggest funder and who's, uh, we have a great partnership with them. Um, I've never met the gentleman to my right before, but he's inspired me because everything he said is 1,000% correct. I'm not gonna read my testimony, I'm just gonna tell you a quick story and then focus on a few things. I have a son who's now 24 years old. When he was in his senior year of college, where he was going to a small liberal arts college that was bankrupting his mother and father. Um, he announced his senior year at Thanksgiving dinner. My parents don't want to hear this, but in my four years of college, I learned more at that job I had coaching youth kids in the town than I did in four years of college. Now, I sort of didn't want to hear it, but I think it, but, but, but I knew that what the gentleman to my right um, was saying, and I knew where that was coming from, and, I, and your experiences as well. I think this notion of connecting children to experiences <clears throat> um, in the workforce is absolutely essential to the development. I see it in my home, I know it in myself, and the, the literature and in in our experience at PAL says that. Um, my emphasis on, and I think the council is, uh, uh, I think it is a tremendous statement about the values of our legislature here in New York that you would make this bold statement to ensure universal uh, uh, experiences for young people. I have just a couple of cautionary, not ca cautionary is maybe not the right word, but just we would urge us to go through a process where we consider the following. Um, Young people need uh, the sort of training and support both before the job, often during the job, and after the job. And that requires resources, not only at DYCD's level, but at the CBO's level. Our ability to support young people before and during the job is vital to their success. Um, you know, we sort of sit to some degree in local parentis with them, and, um, and, and I believe that all the equality that was mentioned before, or strides to equality, cannot happen unless we really support the young people before and during the job. So I would just emphasize and sort of finish with, um, this is a tremendous step that uh, New York City is sort of contemplating. I would just urge that we think of it in a broad sense, not only simply identifying a good school or a good job for a kid to have, but making sure that um, we support that young person um, through the job, when they falter, all of us falter, get them back up on the horse, um, and provide them the training and experience that they deserve. And when they get that training and experience, um, uh, 
again, I agree with what was said before. Uh, young people are young people. If we lined up 10 young people here and dressed them all the same and asked them to talk about themselves, you wouldn't be able to tell who's who and what's what. They need opportunities. That's what separates them. Your leadership is providing those opportunities. The CBOs, Police Athletic League, and, and my colleagues here are all very supportive of those opportunities. But we need to invest in those organizations to support the young people to succeed. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chairperson Rose, and thank you to the council at large, and specifically to the council members who are taking a lead in expanding this effort, namely council members Torres, Carlos, Traeger, and Levine. My name's Alicia Guevara, and I'm the CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters, the nation's first youth mentoring organization and the largest in New York, and I am going to read my testimony, so please bear with me. Um, but I'm here today to express our support, our support for the establishment of a universal youth employment program. We know that with over one million people ages 14 to 24 in our city, we must focus our energies on building the next generation of leaders. Youth employment opportunities have a proven and positive impact on participants, and we know that there's still so much more to be done to set our city's youth up for success so that they do earn livable wage salaries and become positive contributing members to our community and to our economy. The mission of Big Brothers Big Sisters is to support and build mentoring relationships that ignite the biggest possible futures for our youth. And we accomplish this by matching kids, our littles, with caring, positive, and reliable adult role models, our bigs. Each mentoring relationship is supported by a trained team of staff who offer coaching and guidance to the match. And over the last 115 years since our inception in 1904, we've seen thousands of matches form lifelong transformative bonds. One-on-one -on -one mentoring relationships will always be a cornerstone of our work and I believe that we have an imperative to meet the unique needs of our city's youth as they age, they grow, and they plan for the future. In the early 1990s, Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City launched its workplace mentoring program. It's a model that brings high school students to now over 65 corporate offices across our city, anchoring our city's business community. And they go for coaching and mentoring, focused on building and instilling in our youth the skills that support their success as they navigate the next steps after high school and gra graduation. But the youth that we serve come from communities where barriers to college and career success are high. Therefore, establishing a universal youth employment program is a key step in preparing our city's young people. In the case of our littles, with professionalism and technical skills to help them build career awareness, career exploration, and encourage them to really explore the full breadth of opportunities available to them in the New York City market. I am proud to share that Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City has made a commitment to expand not only our workforce, our, our workplace mentoring program, but also to invest more resources in our college and career success program, which supports our littles as they transition from high school into post-secondary opportunities. 98% of our littles are graduating from high school. 92% of our littles are entering colleges. This year, we've seen 130% increase in enrollment in our college and career success program. And we believe this growth is correlated with the critical role that mentorship plays in promoting career success. With 90% of our littles identifying as people of color, we're focused on offering culturally competent, informed mentorship that assists them in navigating the complexities that, be, that come from being the only one in the room. People of color report experiencing feelings of imposter syndrome at higher rates than their white counterparts. And mentorship has been identified as a key reinforcement in processing these experiences and driving career success. But if we succeed 
in supporting formative professional journeys of our littles, and we do not also provide them with the opportunities to gain workplace experience and employment, we have not done enough. We know that close to 70% of people secure jobs through connection in their network. Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City's workplace mentoring and college and career success programs support our littles in building their social capital, in creating meaningful professional connections, and expanding the network of people who can guide them, who can coach them, who can refer them to opportunities after completing high school, whether they choose to pursue employment or higher education. And with 98% of our littles graduating from high school, expanded access to the Summer Youth Employment Program gives our city's youth more exposure to help them define themselves for what they want their next formative step to be and to build professional experiences that continue to ignite their potential. Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City firmly believes that equitable access to employment opportunities for our youth is not only a moral imperative, but an economic investment. In partnership with the New York City Council, we would willingly offer our expertise around mentorship and its role in career readiness and success to support the successful enactment of this law. So I want to thank you for your leadership and the leadership of the Council and its efforts in supporting this law. Big Brothers Big Sisters looks forward to serving as your ally, as an ally of the city in the critical effort to expand employment opportunities for all of New York City youth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just have to say um, uh, your testimony about um, what it feels like to be the only one in the room and how important it is to have you know, a mentor or something um, really inspired me to so I'm gonna contact my big brothers, little um, big brothers, big sisters, um, and I, I want to mentor a young a young person um, in in my workplace. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning to the chair and the invited guests and the other attendees. Um, I too will read my testimony um, here, so bear with me. Um, my name is Suzette Boddy, and I'm here today to share my observations about employment access for young people in New York City from my vantage point as the program director of Lighthouse 4, a transitional <coughs> independent living program that provides housing and supportive services to 19 homeless and runaway girls ages 16 through 21. As the name implies, Lighthouse 4 is one of the existing TIL programs sponsored and operated by Core Services Group. A Lighthouse 5 will open soon. Lighthouse 4 is one of 27 residential service programs operated by CORE, which is pleased and grateful for the opportunity to provide a clean, safe, and secure space where more than 2,000 homeless and other underserved individuals sleep each night. So about a little about CORE Services Group. Founded in 2005, CORE is a community-based human services organization that provides culturally sensitive and holistic programs to address the needs of its clients, including families with children, youth, and single adults. CORE's mission is to empower individuals, families, and communities to overcome homelessness, access and maintain employment, gain independence, and live satisfying and productive lives in communities in which they become contributing and productive citizens. CORE achieves its mission by connecting clients to living wage jobs, real world skills training, aftercare treatment services, safe and affordable housing. CORE has successfully implemented programs funded by the Department of Homeless Services, New York City Housing Preservation and Development, New York City HIV AIDS Services Administration, New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, and the Federal Bureau of Prisons. CORE is dedicated to treating all of its clients with dignity and respect in order to build independence and guide them toward self-sufficiency. CORE currently operates transitional emergency and shelter facilities in Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, and Manhattan. Allow me to tell you a little more about the Lighthouse. The girls and women we work with are referred by DYCD. Most identify as members of a sexual and or gender minority. Though some have run away from abusive situations, aged out of runaway 
uh, or run away from foster care, and some have turned tricks or engaged in survival sex to keep a roof over their heads. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the traumas they have endured because that is not what I'm here to do. But I do think it's important for you to understand what these young people have been through and therefore the incredible progress that many of them make while under the care of my staff and our partners that provide substance use disorder and mental health treatment services and other partners such as primary care providers, educational and vocational programs and other supportive services. The Lighthouse offers the youth we serve the opportunity to develop, to develop self-sufficiency while they continue or resume their education, find employment, restore family ties, and build a truly meaningful network support system. The Lighthouse is the bridge that connects our youth to agencies and resources that serve to help prepare them for their journey beyond the safety and support of the Lighthouse program. Part of our responsibility is to prepare our youth for employment while nurturing their desire to make a better life for themselves. The overwhelming majority of our youth have a strong desire to find and maintain a job. They want to work. They know they need a job to make money to survive in the long run. They also know it is difficult for them to find a job, even a part-time, entry-level, minimum wage paying job in New York City, where jobs are supposed to be plentiful and increasing. Our youth are aware that they are last in line and least desirable to the hiring manager. They know if they haven't had a job before and they are still attending school, they are unlikely to be hired. Knowing this affects their confidence and discourages them from job seeking. Some of our youth must also deal with additional barriers, like those I mentioned previously. Some are English language learners or members of the LGBTQ community, which unfor unfortunately subjects them to even greater difficulty getting a job. At the Lighthouse, we strive to engage the most vulnerable youth and help them gain the confidence and experience they need to search for, interview, and secure employment after their work with SYEP has ended. I am testifying today that opportunities like Summer Youth Employment Program and a Universal Youth Employment Program not only bring hope, but provide critical entry-level job experience for our youth. In fact, um, excuse me, and please believe that I have searched for quite a while to be able to characterize what these programs mean to our youth. These jobs are literally lifelines to youth and young adults that have grown up with nothing but parenting failures, unfortunate foster care placements, and chaos all around. These programs offer our youth modest income, but loads of self-esteem when they open a bank account or have real work experience to add to a resume. Without SYEP, they would not have gained work experience, the opportunity to build savings, learn to budget their own money, and to be able to buy for themselves simple things they need and enjoy. I hope you'll take um, the opportunity of next year's budget to increase funding for these programs, whose return, even if it seems intangible, is anything but. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, every time we have a conversation, I have a conversation, council has a conversation with DYCD about um, expanding programs or um, a universal program. Other than the money um, issue, they always talk about capacity. Do you think um, that the providers have the capacity to absorb, um, you know, the numbers that we're asking them to serve in terms of universal universality of uh, summer programs. So I say this. Um, so I worked at DYCD um, from 2003 to 2005 as the youth employment planner. Um, you know, DYCD is a rational actor who is a contract agency. They're not providing the services themselves. Right. They are putting out contracts. And uh, putting out more contracts is more, it's more difficult. Um, and they, I, I don't think, benefit from being on the other side of being actually in the program, seeing all the young people's faces who they work with. So I think by nature of having an administrative agency, uh, the, the, the capacity challenges will be elevated um, because they are the ones bearing the burden for the administration of it, yet don't get to uh, 
you know, as my wife who works in young programs, they drink from that fountain every day of the young people and, their, uh, and seeing them succeed. So uh, I think that is an issue. I, I think the biggest challenge around capacity has been in the past in that um, since the SYP calendar year started at the, fiscal, the city budget calendar year, that has been the capacity issue. Because if you just ramp up slots in April, May, June, and then try to throw them at people, you're just asking for a bad program. And that is why the evaluations of SYP have been great in everything except employment outcomes. Because it wasn't really an employment program that way. You didn't interview. You didn't build a resume. It was a program to put people, young people engage in constructively over the summer. But a school what's great about the school-based model is that it starts much earlier in the year, months ahead of time. And we think it should start, a universal program would never not start. It would always be ongoing because you'd know the slots would be there. So a universal program would allow for providers to build the capacity during the year, the work program slots, sequence them in ways they can't do now. So it's really just about the design of the program. And a school-based model that starts with people working towards next summer in September, October, um, would have the capacity, I think, to serve everyone. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I'll just quickly add that um, you know, the ugly word of money is a factor mm -hmm. in allowing us to do the best job. But I do, again, think my colleague touched on it. We find ourselves scrambling in April and May. So it's, yes, it's capacity, but it's capacity given the, you know, sliver of time we've had to, we placed 1,500 youth in summer jobs over the last several years. And to do that on the time frame we've had to develop the jobs, it, it, it's, we don't have the capacity in that time frame under these circumstances. So yes, a little more investment will always be welcome, but I think a, a, an approach that was broader um, and just quite frankly provided for more time. It's not like, you know, we know next summer is coming. You know, it's not, it's not gonna be a surprise when it shows yeah. up. And I just feel like that's where we often get caught short. I also think that given the population that we serve, it's critical that when we think about the word capacity, we're as comprehensive as possible in our approach to capacity, right? So that it's not a job alone, but all of the other reinforcements that are gonna support the success of that young person in the job. It's no surprise that I bring a particular point of view around the importance of mentoring, and one that's been demonstrated and tested and is measurable. So I wanna make certain that um, I raise that as something to be considered, that capacity when speaking about our youth really needs to be considered in the widest context, in the most comprehensive context. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I just also would like to mention that um, more avenues should be explored in terms of the providers. Um, just in my own observation, it appears that there are a number of providers that um, continue to support the program year after year, but there are many other businesses in the communities that um, th I think those avenues should be explored and you know to, to just um, fill out the need for the capacity. Thank you all. The, um, I guess if you were on Jeopardy, I would say good answer. Good <laughs> answers. Um, I, and, and it really is, it's, it's um, you bring up the point of sort of the timeline. Uh, I fight with them every budget year. You know, let's not do the budget dance. You know that we need you know, these programs, you know we need the money, you know that we need to give the providers time to get, you know, things in place. You know, we need the parents to know that these programs will be in place. So um, I, I appreciate you saying all that you said on, on the record, um, and I want you to know that that's an ongoing battle that, um, that I face with um, at, at budget time, but I am fighting to kind of change how that works so that we can, you know, because I don't like the fact that they use capacity as an excuse for us not to do something that we know there's value in and there is definitely the need. So I thank you all for your very important testimony today. Have a good day. And um, our next panel.
And if you wouldn't mind, um, if you can provide oh. copies of your written testimony, Excuse me. that yes, would be helpful. Could we? Yeah, we need. Excuse me. Could we have uh, copies of your testimony? Um, okay. Thank you. Okay, next is Jesse Lehman, New York City Employment and Training Coalition. Caroline Ioso, Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow. Lindsay Dixon, Urban Assembly. Brian Chen, Chinese American Planning Council. Once you're seated, you can um, tell us your name and what o your organization affiliation, and you can begin your testimony. Good, oh, good afternoon. Uh, good yeah, afternoon. just just barely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Chairperson Rose, uh, for this hearing today. Uh, and thank you also in, absen in absentia to the council members who drafted uh, intro 1474, um, which uh, we certainly think is an important step in the right direction. My name is Jesse Lehman. I am the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. We're the umbrella organization that represents New York City's workforce development community, all the various nonprofit providers, over 150 member organizations that provide a range of, of training and employment services for New Yorkers of all ages, including youth-focused services. Um, and I'm joined here today by a subset of our members who serve youth and who have direct experience with summer youth employment and can provide some specific uh, ideas and information about how a bill like this one would affect them and what some of its pros, uh, especially pros, but a little bit of cons as well, are. Um, I want to just provide a few broad principles um, that we collected from a group of our members asking them their thoughts on this question and moving towards a universal employment program for youth. Um, that we hope will guide you as you uh, work through the possibilities here and uh, the potential of this, this legislation. Uh, first, uh, I think the overarching thing is we want to express broadly our support of the direction that the council wants to go here. Um, the, the, the fundamental principle that all young people in New York deserve the opportunity to work and deserve quality uh, work experiences in the summer as well as part-time during the school year is, is absolutely correct. Uh, and we think that that is a goal that is, is a virtue that the council should state and should move towards. Uh, and in particular, we also want to highlight that one of the, the key uh, uh, positive steps in, included in for, uh, intro 1474 uh, would be making sure, or at least in, in city law, that uh, all young people, regardless of their immigration status, uh, be allowed to have the opportunity to work. Now, we know that that would require you know, logistical difficulties and there, there's some maneuvering to be done here. Um, and in fact, that probably is true, uh, as our testimony acknowledges, in a variety of ways if we were to move to a true universal program. Uh, but that's not a reason to not acknowledge it. It is an, it is an important principle and a valid goal. Um, so I think moving towards a universal program and moving towards a program that allows all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status, to uh, be enrolled are our sort of top two wins here that we think the council should really embrace. Um, we do want to acknowledge one uh, point in the draft legislation that we would strongly recommend be um, amended, uh, and that is to make sure that the language around the definition of youth is uh, broadened to, to include all uh, applicable youth in that age group, regardless of whether or not they are enrolled in a traditional high school. Uh, so we've got to remember that there are young people that are in high school equivalency programs and in a range of other educational programs uh, that are, for whom you, uh, employment in the summer or part time would be a, a tremendous opportunity and an asset for them in some ways even more so than a, a student that is sort of on the traditional track. Uh, we can't ignore them and leave them aside just because they're not in traditional high schools. So make sure to, to uh, include language that encompasses all of our youth uh, in the legislation. 
Other than that, uh, we just want to uh, acknowledge that uh, to move forward in this direction will entail jumping over some hurdles in the future. Budgetary hurdles will be some of those. Um, the, as we expand and as we have expanded summer youth employment, each additional high quality employment opportunity is a little bit harder to find than the one before. Uh, this is not just a cost issue in terms of serving more people and the, more, the larger total cost as a result of scale. It's also a per slot cost issue. It gets harder and harder to find quality uh, slots and we have to make sure that we budget for that. Uh, and I believe you'll also hear from others uh, about just the logistical challenges uh, associated uh, with the expansion of summer youth employment and we need to make sure we tackle those. Um, I think uh, we've heard some really good points uh, to that end already from uh, our friend Lazar Treshin at Here to Here, uh, and I think you'll hear soon as well from the folks at United Neighborhood Houses, and we agree with a, a lot of what both of them have to say on that. Um, that is, that is the, the broad encapsulation of what the workforce community thinks about this. It's a step in the right direction. We wanna commend the council for thinking this way, and we re recognize that there will be hurdles to be leaped uh, to get there. Um, with that, I wanna hand it over to some of our members to talk about their experience and knowledge. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Okay. Um, my name is Caroline Ioso, and I am the Director of Community and Government Affairs at Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, OBT. Um, thank you so much, Chairperson Rose, for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I'm here to express support on Intro 1474, provided, as um, Jesse mentioned, provided that the bill expands to include those 18 to 21 years of age who are enrolled in a high school equivalency program. Um, OBT is one of New York City's largest providers of workforce development um, and education services for opportunity youth and adults who are disconnected from education and employment. We serve over 4,000 youth and adults every year in Brooklyn and Queens uh, through education, job training, and employment. We support Intro 1474 because work, work experience builds essential skills. Uh, linking our participants to employment after program completion is a core component of the work that we do, and as such, we have relationships with many employers in many different sectors, and each and every one of them tell us that what they are looking for is essential or soft skills. Communication, organization, professional writing, all of that. Think, while some skills can be learned on the job, walking in the door without the ability to collaborate with colleagues and think critically and communicate professionally with a supervisor will really make that job hard to retain. Um, and while workforce training providers like OBT integrate this type of learning into our programs, um, internships and work experience give our youth an opportunity to test these skills in the real world and get that real-time feedback from a manager or supervisor. Um, and expanding city dollars to ensure that any youth who is interested in employment can get it would begin to level the playing field around who has access to building those essential skills and who does not. Um, our second point is opportunities to earn money while in school or programs can help youth commit to program completion. Um, many of our participants who come to OBT after having left a traditional high school, um, they do so because of financial pressures. For these young people, taking the time to work towards a high school diploma was not a calculus that made sense. That time had to be spent earning money to pay rent, purchase groceries, take care of family members. And while our program completion rates at OBT are very high, 87%, um, the reason that a young person stops our program is often financial. And so creating the opportunity for our students to earn money in part-time jobs during the school year incentivizes them to stay in our program. Thirdly, work experience creates a professional network that helps youth access employment in the future. We have heard this uh, this morning several times already, and, and we'd just like to reiterate that again and again we hear that um, our, our youth are finding their next step in their career pathway via the connections that they've made in internships or work experience. Um, and we are very pleased with Intro 1474's commitment to the equity that that really ensures. Um, however, we would reiterate that 1474 must include 18 to, 20 to 21 year olds who are in HSE programs. Um, I think 
by leaving out that population, we're leaving out a population who would really, really stand to benefit from the points that I just outlined. Um, so more than 50% of those in our high school equivalency program, um, you know, it serves 17 to 24 year olds and more than 50% of those are 18 to 21. Um, thank you so much to the council for considering this issue, for the value that you're putting on it. We really appreciate it. And thank you for the time to testify. Thank you. Good afternoon, <clears throat> and thank you for being with us, and thank you so much for all of your work on this issue. My name is Lindsay Dixon. I am going to read because I'm speaking on behalf of the Urban Assembly. I'm the Director of Career Readiness for the Urban Assembly Schools, so it's my honor to work with our almost 10,000 middle and high school students in New York City. Um, we've spent the past 15 years working with the Department of Education to create CTE schools and strong employer school partnerships. So we are super excited and we are energized by this bill and are in full support of it. Of course, there are things to figure out, and I'll speak a little bit to that and others have, um, but we're all in. Um, and as we know, as my colleague just mentioned, the skills required to navigate the future are those soft skills, the social emotional learning skills, problem solving, creativity, um, the things that are best learned on internships, the things that are best learned experientially. Um, and so as Lazar mentioned earlier, I can't think of a more powerful opportunity for young people to have a 10-month school year and then a school year that also includes a summer with a paid internship. And with all due respect to the great value that is guest speakers and service learning, when those aren't paid opportunities, you're hitting a student in their pocketbook and you're also depriving them from the opportunity to get a reference and to get something on a resume. And we have high school students in New York City graduating with blank resumes, literally, and, and that should not be the case. The mayor's office, the Department of Education, city council members, DYCD, and other stakeholders have unequivocally made equity a central theme of their work for young people going forward. I cannot think of a more equitable thing to do than expand access to summer and school year internships for all students, not just those lucky enough to win a literal lottery or those whose parents are able to line up an opportunity for them, but all students in all communities in this city. The benefits will undoubtedly affect this entire city as high school internships have been proven to increase high school attendance, graduation and exam pass rates, college enrollment and persistence from year one to year two, Youth employment, which is 86% higher after a young person has an internship, they are 86% more likely to be employed the following year, as well as internships in high school correlating with a decrease in crime and youth mortality. Youth mortality. So as someone said earlier, this really is life and death. Many New Yorkers have already indicated strong support for a universal internship program, and we know that historically, public support is much higher for programs that would benefit all of our young people, hence it not being called AP for some or pre-K for most. For all is for all. As we continue to see dangerously high youth unemployment in this city and around the country, there's never been a better time to begin. In closing, I want to acknowledge we recognize that this bill does represent a significant scaling up of the current SYEP infrastructure, which will require real commitment and collaboration from all involved. We've spent the past years working with schools to train and support teachers and administrators in managing strong work-based learning programs. So we know the hard work involved, but we believe that if schools have the right support and training, it does lessen the burden on CBOs. And if CBO partners have the right resources, including adequate and consistent funding, then it makes it easier for employers to commit. And when employers commit to employing and training young people, our entire city will recognize phenomenal benefits for decades to come. I have no doubt that if given the proper support and consistent funding, this groundbreaking program will work and it will work for all of us. The Urban Assembly, as a model provider with deep expertise in capacity development and work-based learning programs, is ready to roll up our sleeves and support however we can in making this crucial program equitably available to all students in New York City, undocumented, high school equivalent students, all students. Um, that concludes my testimony as written. If I may switch to a very brief moment of private citizen hat, it is a very real irony to be sitting under a seal that says that we, Thomas Jefferson, are equal and exact, that we should have equal and exact justice regardless of our persuasion. And today, the Supreme Court of the United States is taking up employment just as we are today. 
but they're taking it up from the point of view that our students who, by the way, in New York City, 23.6% of students identify as LGBTQ in New York City. And in our schools, 95% of them are, are youth of color. So that's doubly students who are already disenfranchised in employment. Employment is life and death. We do not have portable benefits in America. I had a parent who died because they did not get access to the health care that rich people have access to. Um, so this is life and death for our students. I appreciate you all so much for fighting. If the world's already gonna be hard enough and maybe the Supreme Court passes a law that says that our gay and trans students can be fired, let's please, please make sure that high school students in New York City do not graduate with a blank resume, but they have tons of people willing to be a reference for them, to get them in the door, because more than two out of three jobs are earned through the who you know and not what you know. So this day matters, this work matters. Thank you all for the years that went into this. And that concludes my personal part of the testimony. Thank you. Thank you. It's gonna be very difficult to follow that testimony when I'm gonna try. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Chair Rose. My name is Brian Chen, and I'm the Director of Education and Career Services for the Chinese American Planning Council. We're the nation's largest Asian American social service organization uh, with over 50 programs at 33 sites in the boroughs of Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens. And the last time I actually spoke with you, we mobilized over 50 youth, many of whom who were uh, over the summer, many of whom were engaged in SYP, others who weren't, uh, and brought them to the steps of City Hall to, to essentially meet with yourself and public advocate Williams uh, to advocate for another bill, intro 1670, uh, to ensure that uh, youth employment and education programs would be accessible to all regardless of status. And so uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in my testimony, but that emphasizes really the importance not only to, uh, to CPC of really making this uh, youth employment accessible and equitable, but also the community members and the youth that we work with. Founded in 1965, CPC is a social service agency that creates positive social change. We empower Asian American, immigrant, and low-income communities in New York City by ensuring they have equitable access to the resources and opportunities needed to thrive. We are the trusted partner to more than 60,000 individuals and family each year. CPC proudly operates several city-funded youth employment initiatives that our colleagues at DYCD uh, mentioned earlier, including the Summer Youth Employment Program. Last summer, CPC placed over 2,300 youth at 390 work sites spanning the public, private, and nonprofit sectors citywide. Collectively, our youth earned over $4.4 million in wages and stipends. Last summer, CPC also had the pleasure of partnering with two New York City public high schools on the new school-based SYP model. Both schools wanted to incorporate summer employment experiences to complement their year-round internship programs. Although CPC was able to provide many of these students an, uh, year round internships and, comp and provide continuity for many of these students uh, through SYP, an unintended consequence of our collaboration involved having to turn away a number of interested young people from applying because they were undocumented and did not have the requisite employment authorization. As one of the city's largest youth employment providers, we appreciate the council's continuous investment in our youth. However, for those who are not selected through lottery-based programs like SYP or cannot apply simply due to their immigration status, the skills and experiences gap between them and their peers continues to widen. Thus, CPC is supportive of both Intro 1474 and another bill that hasn't been introduced today uh, or hasn't been talked about today uh, but was introduced by public advocate Williams 1670 to make youth employment opportunities more inclusive, equitable, and accessible to all of the city's youth. At CPC, we've seen firsthand the positive impact employment and internship programs have, have in the lives of youth and young adults. Participants are able to explore their career interests, gain core employability skills, and become more active members of their community. They're overwhelmingly more engaged, motivated, and prepared to achieve their education, career, and life goals. Being the fairest big city in the nation means ensuring all of our young people have an opportunity to participate in the best youth employment and education programs in the country. No barrier should ever define an individual's potential to succeed and thrive, whether in school or in the workplace. This is why over 50 CPC youth, as I mentioned earlier, joined you and Public Advocate Williams on the steps of City Hall this past August to rally for new legislation that would create inclusive, youth employment education opportunities for all school-aged New York City residents. CPC thanks Chair Rose and members of the Youth Services Committee 
for your unwavering leadership and for the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to further engaging with you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and I like the fact that um, all of you have brought up the need to be inclusive. And when we say universal, we mean universal. Um, and do you, any of you, uh, ha, would, would any of you like to respond to, you know, um, our ability to provide the capacity to do so? I think the last panel mentioned that the biggest issue with capacity that we've seen so far is just the last minute nature of it. So I've worked on the workforce development side, I've worked with the 18 to 24 year old side and making those employer partnerships is exceedingly difficult when you're doing it a few weeks in advance and you don't have those partners building that, that work with you all year long. Um, so I do believe it is a, in some cases artificial capacity barrier that is created by the, the funding sequence. Um, because as uh, Lazar pointed out, if we were working toward this all year long, companies would have a better chance to forecast their needs, to create the need. We are the biggest city in, in our country, and there are a ton of jobs. We are at a record unemployment, uh, low unemployment, at least in some categories. So I actually believe the jobs are there. Boston has done a great job with this by working with their Boston Private Industry Council and making it just a part of the work in the city and the contracts that you get, the tax breaks. We, there are a lot of ways. The carrot should not be for the student. Let's pay the student and right. put the carrot out there for the employer who is gonna benefit from the value that these young people bring as a pipeline of talent. Um, so I would say for, for me and having worked with so many great other providers who take our students, help get them ready, and are that conduit between the employer, what we have heard over and over from our, um, from our CBO partners who work directly with those students, that is really about the, the time, because it's about creating the job linkage, yes, and then getting the students ready and working with schools. That is all way too much to do and pack into a few weeks or a couple months. This would help solve for that. Um, so that is my um, kind of experience with the capacity side, and it's doable. There could be year-long training. The Department of Education could lean in and work with DYCD. Um, many of our organizations up here, I'm sure, could do the same. Sometimes it's just skill building that people are willing to have um, developed in themselves as well would help remove some of these barriers if more folks in the schools were better able to get young people ready, then the CBOs could focus more on the employer relationships. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Last question. So next, it's Kim McLaughlin, UAU, David Calvert, Youth Build NYC Collab Collaborative, and JT Falcone, UNH. As you, sit, as you sit down, identify yourself and your agencies, and you can begin your testimony. Hey, David. Shall we all introduce ourselves first, or just I start? So I'm David Calvert. I'm glad there's a few people still in the room. And uh, thank you, Debbie, for being constant. And uh, I'm with the Youth Build NYC Collaborative. So I'm representing 10 Youth Build programs around New York City. And um, A, you know, Youth Build is something that started right here in New York and is now spread across the country. There's 260 Youth Builds in the country now. There's, we're in 23 other countries as well. Um, it's a movement. And um, I've actually changed my testimony for today based on things I've heard today already. Um, so I will, I'll send my testimony uh, online to you, Debbie. But uh, I want to just comment on a couple of things. One is, um, first of all, the role of the city council is so important in pushing the city, pushing DYCD, pushing the executive branch to respond more and more um, because they, they just need the on the ground council members to really show them what really needs to happen out here. And so I just want to really endorse you know, the push you give and the, and the, and the challenge you give to, um, to DYCD to really meet needs in a broader way. 
because the tendency there is to say, well, whatever the mayor puts in the budget, that's, a, that's where it's going to stand. But the council can push the budget. And so, um, so that's so important, and I really endorse that. The second thing is, is about the Summer Youth Employment Program. I've noticed, and I'm a, I'm a SYEP um, graduate as well from way back when, back when it was called the Neighborhood Youth Corps. For the old timers, you remember the Neighborhood Youth Corps. You remember Corps, that. Great I society that programs. Well. <laughs> that was me. So um, now I'm 66, so you know, time moves on. And, um, but but I, I do want to say that, that SYEP used to be very superficially designed. It was just a jobs program. And I noticed this, this summer that DYCD has now started to add in um, some soft skills training into the, into the mix. That is absolutely critical. And I think that the, that's something the council can continue to push uh, DYCD on to, to do the hard work of getting that piece built in stronger because that's what really is what a young person takes with them at the end of the summer. They don't really save the money that gets spent, but they do save the soft skills and the knowledge that they gain. And so that is, to me, critical. And the third and the other part about the SYEP is that it, uh, it, it needs to sort of flow into something that comes up. And if there's opportunity, so every young person leaving the program should really come out with knowledge about what else is out there in the community, what other options there are for them, you know, there should be some kind of world of work structured piece for all the summer youth employment um, uh, uh, trainees. Whether they get that in written or in seminar form or on the sites, they need to come out with knowledge about the work, the work environment. And uh, not just the thing they did that summer, but a broader view. And where can they go? Where's the, where are the beacon programs? Where are the community agencies? Where is there support in the community for them? Where, how do you get a job in the private sector? They have to come out with that knowledge. So, um, and I think that DOE should be pulled into the mix because it really should be structured in um, to the school curriculum somehow to get people ready for the world of work. And, you know, someone mentioned earlier that you can go four years to a liberal arts college and have no knowledge that really got you to, into the workforce. Um, that is true. <laughs> and and the, the statistics show that employers say people that are coming out of college do, are not ready for their for, their, for the jobs that they have. And so we need to kind of close that, that gap between training and, you know, that's being given in schools and what employers need to make you know, to things just work more, more smoothly. I, I think that I, I do want to comment on the Advance and Earn program. The Advance and Earn program is very parallel to what Youth Build does. And I'm, you know, it's, it's, a, it's very commendable that DYCD wants to invest time and attention into this, but the comprehensive approach, the academic piece mixed with the vocational training, the counseling and support, the leadership training, the community service, all the components that I was hearing this morning about advance and, and earn are really so parallel to what Youth Build does and has been doing for 40 years. So I've, I spoke to uh, the deputy commissioner on the way out and he's gonna schedule with me to, uh, we're gonna schedule to, to meet and, and see how Youth Build can be supportive of that effort. But basically, it is so on point to say that it isn't just getting a job, it isn't just getting a wage, it isn't just getting a stipend, it's, it's the whole mix. Um, and so with that, I'll leave it. And I want to thank the council. Uh, Debbie, you are a champion of Youth Build and, um, and unmitigated, and we love you, and uh, thank you for all your support. Thank you, David. Hello, so I'm JT Falcone, I'm with the United Neighborhood Houses, uh, and I'm here, I have a whole testimony I submitted, but I keep hearing you ask about um, some of the challenges with capacity, and I just wanna speak to some of those. So jumping right ahead to my recommendations, um, UNH is philosophically supportive of universality, we're very interested in it, similar to uh, my colleague and UNH member uh, Brian Chen earlier, very supportive of your legislation with the public advocate um, to find ways to ensure that youth, regardless of documentation status, are able to ac access these programs and these opportunities, all very important. Um, there are a couple of things that I want to add on to my colleagues around concerns with um, ways that we can ensure that the process is so streamlined as to allow for universality. Um, so I'm just going to uh, skip right ahead. Uh, the first big piece that we want to think about 
Um, and this is specific actually to uh, the, the younger youth model in particular. Um, I know there were questions around um, retention in those programs uh, and really excited to hear the numbers that DYCD put out. A couple of the recommendations that we want to put on the table. Um, it's really important for youth who are coming to these programs, particularly if they're receiving a stipend for participation, uh, that the fact that transportation costs might be a barrier, particularly on Staten Island, um, but across the city, uh, be taken into account. Providers right now have a limited budget to give some youth um, metro cards, but that's insufficient. As we've shown with Universal Lunch, there's a stigma associated with asking for a free service, and some of the students don't even know that it's an, an option. Um, so I think the best way for us to address that and, and the place where we'd be looking for the council's partnership would be to include money in the budget for uh, providers to ha be fully funded to provide metro cards, particularly for the younger youth. Um, I think it's an issue in the vulnerable youth programs as well. So one of the benefits of this model-based system is that we can ensure that each model is, is uniquely targeted and is uh, designed appropriately for its target model audience. Uh, and in the instance of younger youth, that includes metro cards. I, I don't want to go too deep down onto it, but also uh, food is an element. Um, there are youth who report that they are spending their entire stipend paying for lunch when they come to the program. So we want to find a way to ensure that that stipend ultimately ends up in the youth's pocket. And um, adding a food budget for the programs, I think, would be uh, something that everyone would be able to get behind. Um, into streamlining things, uh, we hear time and again that paperwork is a major challenge for providers. Um, we've actually gotten an estimate from our providers that uh, it takes about two hours to, to conduct an orientation or to conduct an enrollment. Orientation is eight hours and that's done in a group, but the enrollment process one on one with each young person who's enrolling takes about two hours. So if you look at 75,000 young people, that's 150,000 hours that are being spent um, just collecting paperwork. So I have a list of all the paperwork that providers are expected to collect in my testimony. And one of the things that uh, we'd love to work with UICD on is creating a clear uh, packet that just explains to providers exactly what they're expected to have, where one document could count for multiple, um, multiple, so proof of income, uh, or proof of address and proof of citizenship, right, or whatever those uh, two things are that we're proving. Um, so creating efficiencies, that's a big part of it. Um, I also sort of want to flag something here that if you actually look at the um, 2018, 2018 SYP annual summary that DYCD put out, um, a relatively minuscule amount of that money is federal funding at this point, and there's some TANF funds that are mixed in. So we have uh, between, I think, 3 and 5 percent of the funds for this program are income restricted, and yet because that's mixed in just generally across the board, 100 percent of applicants have to prove um, familial income. So if, if we want to think about the ways that those dollars are mixed in, especially we have new opportunities now that there's a model-based system, um, or whether those funds should be there at all is something that we'd be interested in exploring because uh, providers have reported to us that one of the biggest challenges is getting that familial income information. Um, it can be tough, and people aren't necessarily aware that that's going to be a requirement when their, their kids are enrolling. Uh, parents can get concerned, and uh, it can cause hiccups, and providers end up spending hours chasing down. And these are hours that could be used developing employer relationships or beefing up the orientation or leaning into the youth development aspects of the programs, right? But instead, that's just a sunk time cost that exists because of the amount of paperwork that's being collected. Um, the last piece, and I think this is saving the best for last, uh, it's critical that in 2019 we begin moving towards an electronic uh, record and timekeeping system. Uh, once enrollment is complete and we've spent those 150,000 hours enrolling the young people in the program, providers are forced to shuttle from employer to employer to collect timesheets, paper timesheets in person, um, which is a tremendous waste of time for the providers that are going from employer to employer. If you just think about the travel time, and this creates, I think, also a hidden cost um, that makes it really difficult for providers to work with small work sites. Um, so I have some information just on the number of small businesses that are in New York City. And if you think about the number of businesses in New York City, it's 98% have fewer than 100, and 89% of our 200,000 businesses 
uh, have fewer than 20, and it becomes really difficult for many providers to work with any work site that's unable to accommodate more than 10 inter or less than 10 interns. Um, so we're talking about 89% of New York City's businesses that are pretty quickly off the table because they have to travel from site to site, right? So if it's a matter of showing up once and spending some of the time saved perhaps on streamlining paperwork and having an electronic record keeping system to go and conduct the site visit, obviously providers should be checking for the safety of these site placements before the, the youth arrive, um, and that's a part of the program. But if we're talking about every week for six, for 12 weeks throughout the duration of the program, you have to show up at the work sites over and over again to collect this paper. Uh, it, it creates major challenges, and just trying to look at those two bottlenecks on, on the coming in and on the work side that uh, make us cautious when we talk about universality and that can be a drain on that capacity like you're talking about. Um, so I have more information in my, my testimony. I'll wrap it up here, but I just would love to talk to you more about that because I think we are very supportive of this legislation, very supportive of 1670 as well, um, very concerned with making sure that the capacity issues are addressed before we roll them out. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Kim McLaughlin from United Activities Unlimited. I'm actually happy there aren't many people left because I wasn't supposed to be here. So I'd rather less people hear me babble on. Um, my wonderful uh, workforce development supervisor is in Arizona and was kind enough to send me a picture of it as she told me to get to the uh, hearing. Um, so thank you ever so much to the council members for their continued to support and their vision regarding the universal youth employment and as well as all of the other youth services that you've been advocating for. Those of us who have been in the field um, have greatly appreciated it. Now, United Activities Unlimited has been in the workforce development field for over two decades, and we were really part of it in that time when SYEP was exclusively, let's get the youth off the street and into another location. And it has slowly morphed into a much more comprehensive service, and which is phenomenal, and the children will benefit from it. One of the things about United Activities happens to be that we are actually implementing virtually every um, contract in the DYCD portfolio for workforce. So we have our handle in the school base, the younger youth, the older youth, the vulnerable youth. So I think the breadth of our experience helps us to speak to some of those needs and we would be absolutely, and we continue to work together um, on focusing on the logistics that sometimes when the grand ideas come into play, the people on the floor have to put into place and it is cumbersome. I'm laughing just about the picking up of the timesheets. We have a fleet of 100 people who have to go pick up the timesheets and that is the cost associated with it. But we have been able to streamline it strictly because of our, our lengthy experience. Um, moving forward with this initiative, I think everyone can agree, and everyone was so eloquent prior to my presentation, there is a great need. Youngsters have so many barriers. The barriers are across socioeconomics. Um, the, the, le the, um, the deficits that we see in our youth, the inability for them to access, the challenges that they have when they wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, there's so many things that we need to do as the CBOs in order to support those youngsters. And so the vision is that all youngsters benefit from that mentorship to get themselves into opportunities that they are not um, that are not availing themselves and that certain populations are completely completely not um, it's not accessible to them so when it comes to the capacity I think it's important and it's something that we have learned you need full-time staff you need dedicated case planners you need people who are really working in order to help those youngsters give them a phone call remind them of what they need to do help them when they have a little stress during that day very often we have individuals with um, poor coping skills. We need to not only teach the soft skills that are based upon employment, but we need to help some of the emotional skills, the um, daily life skills that will help them succeed in their placement. And that really only comes with the, the support of the CBOs and the recognition that that price for participant needs to consider how much additional support 97% of the youngsters that we place require for them to be successful. So I go back to that quality rather than quantity. Don't try to roll something out um, that doesn't allow any of us to do an excellent job because we've gotten so good at what we're doing, we don't want to go back to the days when we're just 
getting a youngster where they need to go without the resources that they could benefit from. Uh, one of the lovely things about the Work, Learn, Grow program is that we tend to have better connections with our youth because we have a longer time to work with them. So UAU overall supports that program and believes that youngsters who go through the program have a better experience at the end because they've truly developed relationships with the workplace. They absolutely are getting better letters of recommendation from those locations. They're getting stepping stones. So in the universality, we would seemingly have the same outcomes that would be beneficial. There would be a long-term relationship with a work site or an employer, which would be uh, profoundly more beneficial than a limited number of hours under their care. Um, while I'm here on that topic, I will just put out a little negativity in a, in a pleasant regard, and I have to put my glasses on to see it. For Staten Island on a whole, in 2015, we had 1,300 applicants, over 1,300 applicants for Work, Learn, and Grow, and we were able to place 534. That's a very nice number. So here we are years later in 2019, and Staten Island only has 51 slots. So we have thousands of youth during the summer youth portion of our workforce development that are not employed. We have left over 7,000 children that did not get jobs that have applied with us during the summer, and now we have countless other over 1,000 youngsters who are applying for Work, Learn, and Grow, but Staten Island, the entire borough, has only 51 slots. It would seem to me that when there is um, allocation, there should be some consideration to how many students are interested, how many individuals are recruited, the effectiveness of the, uh, the CBO, and then the need. So I just wanted to point that out, um, if I could, if there could be some consideration about that. Uh, in regard to some of your questions, to be candid, I do think it's important for us to realize um, Universal real, will require work sites, and they need to be quality work sites. And that's something that, again, going back 20 years ago, um, UAU has the highest number of private sector placements in the city. I think there's great benefit for the youngsters to be in those placements. It is sometimes difficult, but again, we have over 725, and I think in our portfolio, at least 500. Um, it's important that you engage the work sites, and we've been fortunate because we have full-time staff and we've been doing it, but that moving forward, there should be some consideration of how can we make it a little bit more appealing, aside from just their civic duty, why else would you take the youth? And we've been able to play on the role of it's their civic duty and Staten Island is a silo and we need to support, and so uh, that's lovely, but across the city you might find there's some reluctance, so it would be lovely not only for the children but for the work sites, that there could be some additional incentive for them to take in youth, specifically because you're trying to service a plethora of, of children. Um, and again, I just wanted to thank you for all of your support. It's vital that we do it well when we do it, and UAU as the largest, I believe, the largest provider would love to sit on any focus group just to go piece by piece to say, what are the logistics, how can we do it better, what are some suggestions? And so thank you ever so much for the thoughts around it, for the support of the youth, um, for building this arena which is so vital for the future for the children. Because the reality, it's very hard to get a job. We are graduating children from college who cannot get employed. United Activities is a wonderful agency to work with, but I'm very surprised by the number of engineering majors who are looking for work in the nonprofit realm. Um, we need to do a better job helping our youth get the skills that they need to have employment so they can be self-sustaining and build all of those confidences that they require. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McLaughlin. Um, I did bring up that, um, that glaring number with, um, with the administration, and they said that Staten Island um, had an additional 51 um, That's in a school-based program. For, yeah, bringing you up to 102. Right, but the only youngsters who can apply are in that school. And so we already have 200 youth that we work with normally in the school-based program. This allows McKee High School to have an additional 50. 
So it's not open to the general population of Staten Island. It's exclusive to that school. But thank you so much for bringing oh, it up. It was okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that. So now I will go back to the administration. Right. Those slots are exclusive to a school mm -hmm. who already have a program. Okay. A year-round program. Okay. You're good, Debbie. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. I want to thank you again. All of you have such salient points. Um, you're going to make my fight with the administration so much better. Um, and I appreciate it. Um, and so the capacity issue, I think you've helped me address that you know, very well. And so I look forward to standing on the steps with you, uh, I hope not too many times, but uh, in our effort to, to push them further along with you know, the conversation about universality. I thank you all, it's been a long day for you. Thank you for staying and for your testimony. And with that, I wanna thank all of you for staying and for being here. And um, I want you to know that your testimony and your presence here has not been in vain. We're gonna continue um, to make sure that our young people get meaningful jobs and youth development. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned and it's 12.49. Thank you, David. Thanks so much. <laughs> you know.